There are a few dots on here that stand out, but there are two West Indian. One is Viv Richards, who decades before Sanus J. Saria blew up the power play, had pretty much exactly the same strike rate as him. Look at him over here. No player has been this good in ODI as compared to their peers until Josh Butler came along. But your eye may be drawn to another West Indian. He's one of ODI Cricket's most recent players to cross 4,000 runs with a batting strike rate that defies all odds. Shy Hope is boasting last millennium numbers in a crypto fascist FT metaverse. And I've used this image a couple of times before and he always sticks out. But there is another player on here that also has stuck out a little bit. And that's Jeff Marsh, the father of Sean and Mitch. You may not know a lot about Jeff Marsh, but let's start here. His teammates used to wake up early in the morning in their hotel room and they would see him naked, except for a pair of batting gloves and a baggy green as he was shadow practicing his cover drives. But he also won two World Cups, one as a player and one as a coach, which is really quite something. He was also part of the first opening partnership to bat an entire first day in an England test. Marsh achieved great things on and off, clothed and naked in his career. But he was also Australia's second worst ever specialist test batter when you look at averages with more than 2,500 runs. In 93 innings, he managed four centuries as an opener. And it was a tough era for Australian cricket and in other periods, he probably just wouldn't have played as much. Marsh was a limited player who could blunt the new ball. So Australia kept trying him. And in those days, of course, if you played in a test team, you probably also played in ODIs. In those, Marsh made 900s in 115 knocks, four of which were not out, despite him opening. He also made two not out scores in the 80s and plenty of other high scores. And he certainly wasn't the first ever dependable top order player in one day internationals. Players like Desmond Haynes, Gordon Greenwich and Graham Gooch came before him. And I also understand that 900s probably doesn't seem like a lot now. But when he finished his career, Marsh had the fourth most tons in that format and the ninth most runs in totals. What you had with him was a limited batter averaging more in ODIs and tests and having his name up at the top of the list with absolute greats like Viv Richards and Gordon Greenwich. And part of the reason he's up here was Australia's plan was simple. Marsh would bat as long as he could and the rest of the lineup would try and score quick around him. If that sounds familiar, this is really the origin story of the first anchor in white ball cricket. Now, other teams were slow in this period and other teams also tried to bat it around their top order players, especially their red ball players. But Marsh was the first to really embrace and master that role without any great test match skills. Also, the job was designed around what he could do. You're probably aware of the rules of anchoring these days since players like Marsh laid them out so clearly so long ago. You obviously want this player to score big consistently. That means that your team will quite often have a total of a saw, sort of a low ceiling, but also a high floor team. Your anchor doesn't usually allow you to score over 300 that much, but it stops you from too many sub 150 scores, which was very important in Marsh's era. There's another reason anchors exist is because cricket is a naturally conservative game. And the anchor allows everyone to feel a little bit more chilled that things can only go so wrong. The other thing they found out in one day cricket is 50 overs is a longer time than people originally gave credit. You can even add 20 overs in modern cricket to that. The best game plan in all these forms of cricket might eventually be people trying to maximize their deliveries. But having set batters and wickets at the end is the safer option almost all the time. It's a kind of beautiful, inefficient consistency. And that's what Australian ODI cricket was built around. LinkedIn is part of my online writing course because there are so many cricketers and coaches that are on there. But even outside of that, me and a fellow journalist used to play a game with LinkedIn where we tried to guess what job a former Shield player may have based on their playing style. Surprisingly, we were often wrong. You, however, can use LinkedIn for far more important reasons like creating a job post in minutes, at the hashtag hiring and off you go. You can try screening questions to find people with the right skills and experiences because if you're a small business, well, LinkedIn is a large pond. So don't use this terrific platform to see what Graham Vimpani is up to since he's 100 against the West Indies. Instead, visit linkedin.com forward slash Inca, as in Inca, the back half of my podcast, Red Inca, and you can post a job ad for free. Terms and conditions to apply. And Australia were taking ODIs more seriously than really anyone ever had. Bob Simpson, as coach, had planned and executed a new style of ODI cricket to make it far more different to what we had seen before. Their ability to save runs in the field, 
slow balls, steel ones, hustle twos, and bat around marsh were all cores of what limited over cricket would actually become over the next three decades. During that period, Sri Lanka and Pakistan certainly added to that, and England has completely changed the model a little bit. But what Australia did really does still linger with the current game. But what is so incredible about Mars is just how slow he was even for his time. I mean, if you're hearing a striker at 55 in ODI cricket, and that sounds weird to your ears, let me be clear, that sounded weird to your drunk uncle's ears in 1990. Marsh's strike rate was always low. Shy Hope's strike rate is not historically low, but for modern cricket, it's in the basement. But if there is any major cricket team that needs an anchor, it may just be the West Indies. Their test side has had some moments over the last few years. In T20, they started in the last World Cup, but they won two out of three before then. I think it's quite clear that ODIs are their weakest format. They went within rain or a non-existent DRS call of losing to Scotland and not making the 2019 World Cup. Recently, they were beaten by Ireland at home. And that was when Ireland was using a coach in their 11 because so many people had COVID. If you've been... You know that I like looking at average differentials at time, the difference between what they average with the bat and what they average with the ball. It's not as clean in one day cricket, but it gives you a good idea of how teams are going at the moment, even without looking at strike rate. And it confirms what we know about the West Indian ODI team. In the last five years, they've been dog shit. And they're probably worse with the ball if we're being honest. We even saw in the T20 World Cup how much they struggled to take wickets now. And in ODI cricket, they're the worst bowling teams in terms of wickets. But runs from the bat up, pretty important as well and shy hope has doubled the amount of runs of any other west indian since his career started that's an incredible amount and since on this channel we like showing you things in more than one way he's made almost 20 percent of their runs no one else has 10 percent. he's not just their anchor he's like half the ship but when you look at all the plays in his era you can see just how successful he's been in terms of not only making lots of runs but also just not being dismissed compared to his teammates I mean, it's clear that he is slow. His strike rate is 0.3 runs a ball slower than Shimron Hetmeyer and Chris Gale. But they haven't always been available for ODIs. And when they were, they weren't making his kind of runs. He's basically averaging 50 in the format. So this isn't a participation award. Because while he has been slow, he has still made runs. No matter how slow people bat, averaging 50 is still averaging 50. But the interesting thing about that is, you would assume that he would find test cricket easier. But he has not at all. Not even a little bit. For a player of his obvious talent, this is a terrible record. To be the second worst on this list is almost unimaginable with the way that he can bat. And remember, in the middle of his career, he took on England almost on his own. In that match at Headingley, he came to the crease at 35 for 3 and 53 for 2. Both times, he went on to make 100. And in the second innings, he was not out as the West Indies chased 322. These were both great knocks. For them to come in one game was just brilliant. You watch him bat in Headingley, and then you look at his overall average, and it doesn't make any sense. And it's not just test cricket. Hope is not great in T20. He's not even that good in T20. For a modern West Indian, that's fairly unique. Although he's not completely alone. Craig Brathwaite has never actually played a T20, so I suppose we don't know how he would go. Hope has played over 50, but that's a slow Tuesday for Kyron Pollard. Hope has less than 1,000 runs. At current count, I have him as the 523rd most runs in T20 cricket. He has so few that I can't in good faith show you how low his strike rate is compared to the all-time players. But anyway, here is his strike rate compared to the all-time best T20 players. He just hasn't made many runs and done it really slowly. And by no runs, I mean he's averaging under 20. While only striking at 117, it's pretty unheard of to bat that slow and still struggle to make runs in T20 with the kind of talent that he has. I mean, his average is exactly 30 lower in ODIs than it is in all T20 cricket. In fact, this is probably the most startling thing I have found. He has more ODI runs than he has Test and T20 combined. And I'm not looking at T20Is here, but all T20. And he has batted in 96 innings for ODIs, but 123 across Tests and T20s. And yet, the numbers aren't close. He has way more ODI runs. Over 60% of his runs are from that format. I find that extraordinary. And over the years, the big knock on hope, and let's be honest, kind of all anchors, is that they are very selfish. And we certainly have batters to put their game first. It can be a side effect of how batting works, really. But with anchors, we don't often say that they are just limited or playing a role, or in some cases, both. And I don't really know what the truth is on hope, but he has not yet found a way to score in any other format or score quickly at all. To me, Shai Hope does not appear to be an anchor through choice. 
If anything, hope is like Marsh, in that he may be limited, but he has... ...are a very particular set of skills. And for whatever reason, so far they haven't really worked in tests where he gets bogged down and quite often just struggles with seam bowlers. And they don't work in T20 when even the moderate strike rate he has seems to get him out a lot. Shy Hope skills only work in ODIs and then only in a way that allows him to make a lot of runs, but really slowly, which should in theory mean that the West Indies can bat around him, but they haven't really shown that ability. So instead, what we've really ended up with is an anchor without a ship, which isn't that useful at all. But what an anchor Shy Hope is. It's startling how much he sticks out. And these days you can't watch a T20 game without hearing about anchors. And yet our brightest throwback to that incredible position is in the format that started it all.